Hi folks, today I've got a Tektronix 465 as oscilloscope on the bench. And before I even talk about that, I want to talk about one that um, I got into several months back and I've never finished it. That's a Tektronix 2245A. Now that scope belongs to me and it has issues in the power supply. And off camera, I spent a lot of time going through it. And I've come to the conclusion that since there's a seriously heat damage section of the board that it's probably better at this point to see if I can find a replacement power supply. So that's why that's why that is still sitting on the shelf. It belongs to me. I'm waiting for one to come along at a good price and then I'll just buy that, drop it in, and it should be good to go at that point. But meantime, this Tektronix 465 belongs to a friend who got it from someone who told him it had no trace. Now, I haven't plugged this in yet, but he, my friend said he couldn't get anything on the display either. So we're going to take a look at this thing and see if we can figure out what's going on. Hi folks, so after initially starting this video, I decided I better take a look and see exactly what the problem with this oscilloscope is. And unfortunately, it's going to be beyond economical repair, and I'll explain why that is. But I did locate and uh, pinpoint the problem, and that necessitates the discussion of how to measure higher voltages. Now, most meters that you buy, most digital multimeters, will have stamped right on the front panel the maximum amount of voltage it will withstand. And most of them are about 1,000 volts. And remember, you have to take account your leads too. Not all leads are rated at the same voltage that the meters are. Um, so that necessitates the use of a high voltage probe. Now I bought this one many years ago when I used to service CRT based televisions. Uh, this is a Fluke 80K-40. And the dash 40 suffix indicates that this probe is good up to 40 kilovolt peak. And we're going to take a look at the, at the specs for this. <clears throat> and we're also going to look at the diagram because essentially what this probe does is it creates a voltage divider using the input impedance of the meter. So it's very important that your meter is 10 mega ohm. Again, most of them are. However, my Keithley benchtop meter at below 100 millivolts, I believe, is greater than 1 gig ohm input impedance. So if I were to use that, I would have to go into manual ranging and lock it onto the 1 volt range. So anyway, let's take a look at this, and then we're going to have a discussion of high voltage and oscilloscopes. All right, so here is the manual for the Fluke 80K. Okay, and you can see here, it tells us that our 80K-40 is good up to 40,000 volts peak AC or DC. Now, I highly recommend you get a probe that's good up to 40K because most of the other ones are good up to six, which is not gonna cut it. And I think there's also one that goes up to 15 that also won't do. You want one that does at least 20 to 25 kilovolt. And this is the one I picked up. I got it fairly cheap, but again, I bought that thing over 30 years ago, so it's been a minute. Um, anyway, let's take a look at this page of the manual, and this gives you the uh, theory of operation. This is basically a passive attenuator. You can see it's just a simple voltage divider, and it uses the 10 mega ohm input impedance of the meter. And this is why it's so important for you to have a meter that has an input impedance of 10 mega ohm. Um, this is the values of the resistors that you would see in this circuit for the various types of uh, probes that you buy. And if you have a meter that has other impedances, it tells you here at the bottom, you use either an external shunt, if it's higher than 10 mega ohm, or you need to use a correction factor. And who wants to do that? Fortunately, as I've said several times, most digital multimeters have an input impedance of 10 mega ohm. And if you're not sure, it's best to refer to the manual to make sure what it is. Okay, there are many Tektronix 465s still in service today, which is a testament to superior design, construction, and parts used. 
That said, they're now around 50 years old and they're gonna have problems because nothing lasts forever. So we have a no display problem. What can cause that? Well, there are a variety of things, again, at this age, but uh, the vast majority of the times, it's usually an issue with the high voltage supply that feeds the CRT. There are other things that can cause it. You can have blanking issues. You can have other low power supply issues that will affect not only no display, but there may be other problems. We don't know. We have no display. So that could be an issue too. Um, 30 years ago, I was replacing defective power supply caps in these. And I, as I've said, these things aren't getting any younger. Um, so we're just gonna check a few things to see if we can determine what the problem is. Um, but I'm pretty sure we're gonna have some high voltage issues. So we're gonna talk about that. This is a partial shot of the uh, high voltage section and CRT of the Tech 465 we currently have on the bench. Um, most scopes use a scheme like this where they have a transformer that they drive with an oscillator. And what it does is it allows us to step up the voltage here on the secondary side, but there's always a trade-off. We get higher voltage but lower current, which is fine. CRTs are, are high impedance devices, so we just need voltage. We don't need any significant current. So you see here that we have a test point that is 2,450 volts, negative 2,450. And we're gonna test that and then we're gonna test the voltage going into the CRT because basically high voltage circuits and scopes and televisions for that matter are divided into two basic sections, high voltage and really high voltage. And what that means is that, let me put a larger diagram up here. Yeah. We have our high voltage and at the top, eh, Tell you what, let me reconfigure. All right, sorry about that. So anyway, this is our negative 2450 down here at the bottom. And then we feed a high voltage multiplier. Now this is just a potted assembly containing diodes and capacitors. And it takes the pulse DC going in and it raises it from our negative 2450 up to, and it's really hard to see here, for whatever reason, the blue's kind of washed out and it may be my printer, but this is supposed to be 14 to 16 kilovolt. That's why we want a meter that goes up to at least 20 because if I had the six uh, kilovolt, I'd still be off range to read this. We're gonna have to read this. So I'm gonna show you how we safely take voltage measurements of these and I will show you where the problem is and why we're not going to be fixing it. One of the things that can cause a lack of display, especially in an item of this age, would be an open filament winding in the, in the CRT itself. And the filament voltage comes off of this winding in the transformer right here. But I need to warn you that this voltage, while most filaments are usually six, six volts, this is elevated to the negative 2450 by this connection right here. And the purpose of that is to prevent arcing within the CRT. So if you go to measure the pins of the CRT with your multimeter, you may wind up with a nasty surprise that would necessitate possibly buying a new meter or and or a new pair of underwear. You don't want to just measure this with your meter. You're far, far better served by just turning the lights out and looking and see if you can see the CRT glow. Uh, alternatively, you can um, pull the CRT connector off and just check continuity between pins 1 and 14, but that doesn't tell you if your supply here is good. You can usually look down into the back of the CRT and then just see if your filament is glowing. Um, that's probably the easiest and safest way to do it. So just remember that you have to take a look at everything and not assume that simply because this is a separate winding and filaments are usually low voltage, that this is a low voltage. This is elevated, as you can see right here. Okay, so I've got the, case, the scope out of its case and gaining access is very simple. Um, we have a screw in each one of these legs here 
and a screw here so just take these six and the back piece comes off and the scope just slides front ways out of the case all right so we just slide it out of here and it's very easy to get to everything inside is a little more difficult to get to uh, incidentally um, these scopes are really well designed these ridges are for wrapping up the power cord for storage for transport um, However, having said that, I'm just going to go off on a little bit of a tangent here. I feel if you're buying a scope today, even though these were excellent scopes in their day, they have, they're at least 50 years old at this point. Many of them are going to have problems. Uh, some of them, I was changing out defective filter capacitors in these 25 years ago. And I can assure you they haven't gotten any younger and getting to them is a bear because they're big filter caps hanging down here which necessitates loosening this entire board to just be able to get to these i've done it it's not my favorite thing at all I'm, in fact i don't remember i may have pulled the side uh, pcb off in order to access these caps it's, it's been a while i do remember it was painful but anyway we're in here now and this is our 2450 test point 2450 volts right here I'm not sure if it's glaring or not but this is where we're going to be testing it at so we need to connect our meter our probe to our meter and we also very important you'll note that this probe has two cables coming out and they terminate like so this goes to the meter. This is the ground side of the meter. This goes to the chassis of the device under test. So we're gonna connect that right to here. And then we are going to plug our probe in to our meter like so, observing that our ground tab is on the common or black terminal. And we're gonna to go to DC volts and try and get all this in the shot which may necessitate moving the camera a bit okay that looks pretty good now we're going to turn this thing on and see what we get and there you have it negative two dot five three three now remember this is a thousand to one divider so that's two thousand five hundred volts so it looks like we have good high voltage however we need to check the really high voltage the 14 to 16 kilovolt and i'll show you how we do that okay so you may have heard that a uh, crt will hold a charge now, why would that be well, you have to stop and understand how the, um, how the tube itself is constructed. And CRTs, you've probably seen, have that kind of flat gray coating on the outside. Uh, that's called Aquadag, or it's an, I believe it's the manufacturer's brand name for an aqueous graphite solution. And it's painted on the outside of the tube and also on the inside. And if you remember, the definition of a capacitor is two conductors separated by an insulator. Glass is next to an insulator, and the graphite is a conductor. Therefore, this CRT will hold the charge. Any CRT will. So we need to make sure that when we disconnect the high voltage anode that we discharge the tube. We're going to just discharge it right to the case here because we don't like getting shocked. It can be hazardous to your health and well-being, and it's no fun. So we just pull the connector out and ground it right to here. I think you saw a spark. So, yeah, I didn't even have to get, make it to here. It's been grounded out here. It should be okay. Now, the other thing we need to do is the high voltage comes from down in there and i believe at one point i had an extender for that which i no longer have so i'm just going to put a piece of wire on here 
and insulate it so it doesn't arc because high voltage likes to arc. So we need to put this on and then put a piece of tape over here so we don't get any arcing to the chassis. Okay, so if we do this and put that down in there, we should be good to get a high voltage measurement. So I'm going to turn this on. If we hear it arcing, I'm going to turn it right off. Okay, and you can see our problem is instead of having our expected 14 to 16K, we're looking at more like five. So we need a high voltage multiplier. Uh, I found one on eBay. It's $60 plus $15 shipping plus labor, meaning we're not going to be doing this. So I just wanted to walk you through the process of how we take high voltage measurements and uh, show you where the problem with the scope is. Basically, we would be replacing that block. They're usually about like this. Um, I don't know where it is in this. I've never replaced one in here. I have replaced them in other scopes. Uh, some of them can be really hard to find. This one, the only one I found was in Greece. It would have to be shipped over here to the US. It would take quite a while. Um, for the kind of money it would cost, because don't forget, I have to charge labor for this too, even though it's a buddy of mine. Um, you know, we're talking over $100. My scope cost me $105 when I bought it seven years ago. Uh, call it $150 today, you can get a much newer scope that has better features, uh, younger capacitors. It's just kind of a no-brainer. Um, as I've said at this point, these scopes are well over 50 years old. They're going to need some kind of service. They're very popular because people like the fact they have no um, hard-to-find ICs in there. But the newer scopes that are out there have enough carcasses on the market that you should be able to find any parts you need. So my recommendation is go for something a little newer than the 400 series scopes like the 465 or 475, 485. Go for something in the 2200 series, 2400 series. There are some excellent values to be found in there and you shouldn't have the kind of problems you'd have with, this, with a piece of this vintage. So anyhow, we're going to have to stop this here. I wish we could show you a display on here, but it's simply not worth repairing. This happens. Anyway, um, I want to thank everyone for watching this video. And as always, I like giving back to the community that's given me so much. Thanks a lot, folks.